and welcome to How Hollywood Does It. I'm Jeffrey Hill. And I'm Mark Graves. This program is a multi-part look at the history, techniques, movements, and people who create the magic that we call motion pictures. Today, we go global, or look at global cinema, that is. While American cinema has had a widespread influence on world popular culture almost from the beginning, Many other nations have had significant national film traditions that have also had an influence. But rather than provide a panoramic view of each national cinema, we're going to concentrate on some of the most influential world film movements and filmmakers since the beginning of cinema. And Mark, I think first we would turn to Germany, a country with a rich artistic history, with cinema is no exception. And in fact, Jeffrey, we can thank early German filmmakers for some of the most innovative and stylish contributions to narrative filmmaking, particularly in the area of cinematography and mise-en-scene. Sure. German cinema definitely suffered as a result of German defeat in the First World War, and popular American cinema portrayed Germans of that era as heel-clicking, dastardly Prussians hell-bent on creating havoc and destruction. To combat such images at home and abroad, the German government established the Universum Film AG, or UFA, or UFA as it's more commonly known, a private film company made up of smaller studios. UFA became known for producing particularly high quality and artistically sophisticated motion pictures during the golden age, as some called it, of German cinema. That golden age, according to most film historians, started with the cabinet of Dr. Caligari. Why don't we take a look at a clip from that silent film? This film certainly pushed the boundaries of what was possible with filmmaking. As what this clip shows, the film uses a mise-en-scene that is a set, a design of odd shapes and unusual camera angles, along with interesting makeup and rather atypical lighting. This was certainly unique for this time in motion picture history. Let's not overlook that this part of motion picture history lasted from the production of the cabinet of Dr. Caligari in 1919 until Hitler's government took over the German film industry upon his election as chancellor in 1933. Yeah, I mean, that short 14-year period that parallels Germany's Weimar Republic saw the beginning, zenith, and decline of German expressionism as a film movement. And in a brief, of course, expressionism, Jeffrey, as you know, refers to the outer visual representation of an inner essence or inner psychological states. And the fact that German expressionist film filmmakers shot their productions entirely in a studio enabled them to use the camera freely to represent a subjective rather than objective point of view. Yeah, and, and these inner spaces often resembled no external environment in the way, say, that a nightmare is a mixture of seemingly unrelated events, circumstances, and people placed in a quasi-realistic or totally unrealistic setting. Thus, German filmmakers, German expressionist filmmakers, were required to create such an environment entirely on a soundstage. And certainly the ability to manipulate totally such elements of mise-en-scene as set design and lighting aided in the production of two types of Weimar era films, the expressionist mm. fantasy productions such as director Robert Wine's The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, F.W. Murnau's Nosferatu, and even Fritz Lang's Metropolis, with their emphasis on the surreal and imaginary, and the psychological dramas that remain rooted in realism, such as Murnau's The Last Laugh. No film, though, better exemplifies German expressionist cinema than the films that roughly bookend the movement, that is, The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari and Metropolis. In Caligari, a paranoid man's fantasy brackets an internal story of a traveling hypnotist, his sleepwalking sideshow attraction, 
and a series of unexplained murders in a small community. This production design of Walter Ryman, Walter Rorig, and Human Worm creates a nightmarish, grotesque world of mystery and horror. Certainly oblique lines and twisted geometric shapes violate our eyes' natural comfort with the horizon, proving very disorienting. And Ryman's cinematography emphasizes the deep shadows in mysterious spaces that anticipate film noir's contrastive lighting by about 20 years. And then moreover, Caligari creates its grotesque and disconcerting texture through set design and cinematography. Metropolis thematically depicts a futuristic above-ground world epitomized by a conflict between the haves and the have-nots. The haves occupy a city dependent upon the misery and labor of the subterrane have-nots. This movie offers an important message about compassion and brotherhood in the wake of emerging technology. Although considered one of the most important science fiction films in the history of cinema, the film ironically creates its air of menace by evoking iconography and myths and legends from the past. Such myths such as allusions to Noah's Ark, Noah's Flood, ancient Babylonian belief systems, the legend of the Tower of Babel, and the erection of cathedrals to bring humanity closer to God. Yeah, the drudgery of workers is certainly revealed in the rhythmic swaying as one as they descend to the underworld, which is populated by the machines that keep the bright lights of Metropolis functioning ensuring the privileged lifestyle of the leisure classes. We shouldn't overlook, of course, the triumphant ending, which brings workers and the chosen one together, head and heart, in the guise of Metropolis' heir apparent, Fetter Fredersen. Yeah. Besides all the terrific set decoration in Metropolis, the robot version of the crusading humanist Maria should be noted. She is clearly the inspiration for later movie robots, including R2-D2 and CP-3O from George Lucas's Star Wars. Definitely, definitely the case. Murnau's The Last Laugh emphasizes the psychological and realistic vein of expressionism in the era. Through free and fluid movements, the camera is able to chronicle actor Emile Janning's masterful performance as an aging, demoted doorman at an upscale hotel without the need for any intrusive inner titles to identify all their emotional nuances. The revolving door of the hotel comes to symbolize the relentless rise of progress, valuing the services an individual can provide rather than the human being him or herself. Ultimately, though, all good things must come to an end, as the Weimar era cinema gave way to a more social realist style with the rise of Hitler, with films that were designed to entertain but also to identify threats to the German people and their sense of well-being and amusement. Yeah, German directors such as Eric von Stroheim and Fritz Lang produced memorable sound films such as The Blue Angel and M. German cinema has been perhaps most influential in American cinema. That is in terms of expatriation, since many important films during the studio era were produced with German expatriate directors at their helm. Lang, von Stroheim, Robert Steelmark, uh, Billy Wilder, and Douglas Sirk. These are just to name a few. Yeah. At the same time that German cinema was fine-tuning elements of mise-en-scene to evoke various moods on screen, hundreds of miles to the east, Soviet filmmakers were experimenting with editing techniques contributing to the creation of narrative, or methods of combining shots and sequences to create a story. But not entirely by choice, Jeffrey. Yeah. Czar cinema before the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917 followed the typical worldwide trends consisting of films in various genres. Rising political tensions between the Bolsheviks and the white Russians who were in control right after the downfall of the Romanov dynasty limited Soviet, Soviet access to quantities of raw film stock. As a result, the shooting of longer artistic sequences was impossible. And Soviet filmmakers concentrated on conveying a message as much in how shots were put together as in the action in the shots themselves. Awareness of these editing techniques developed as a result of a series of experiments within the newly established Moscow Film School. Yeah, burgeoning filmmakers edited and re-edited already exposed film footage, including a copy of D.W. Griffith's epic Intolerance, to basically see the effects on narrative brought about by rearranging shots. From this context emerged the Kuleshov effect, or experiment, a way of encouraging audiences to link seemingly unrelated sequences into a coherent narrative thread. And let's take a look at the following short tutorial produced by our very own Jeffrey Hill. Using five different shots, 
two showing a man and woman walking separately in opposite directions in two different parts of a Russian city, another of them coming together in yet another part of the city, with the man pointing to something beyond the film frame, a shot of the White House from an American film, and the last image of the two actors climbing a flight of steps. Kalushov induced the audience to connect these disparate pieces into a coherent sequence. As the tutorial points out, shots separated by geography and even time can be joined to create a link that doesn't exist between shots when presented individually. The narrative, emotional, and intellectual effects that Soviet filmmakers realized stemmed from how shots were linked eventually became known as montage, which is basically the French word for editing. Filmmakers such as Sergei Eisenstein and others drew upon experiments to enormous effect in the classic era of Soviet cinema. Because of its depiction of the oppressive czarist officers on board, the Soviet government sanctioned Eisenstein's dramatization of the 1905 mutiny of sailors on a czarist battleship, the silent masterpiece of Battleship Potemkin. Eisenstein combined actual historical events and dramatic license to create a powerful propaganda film. Prior to the Odessa step sequence, the solidarity between the citizens of Odessa, where a general strike has been called, with the sailors on board the Potemkin has been solidified by the lying in state of a murdered sailor brought to shore. Word of mouth spreads the news, and the citizens flock dockside to pay homage to the martyr. Although the massacre of citizens on the steps leading from the city to the port probably never took place as Eisenstein portrayed them, the filmmaker's juxtaposition of sequences showing the encroaching Cossack army marching to the sea to disperse the crowd with the frightened citizens fleeing in their wake certainly suggests czarist oppression. Yeah, Eisenstein intercuts the reactions of individual citizens, an old man, a legless woman, a student, a mother pushing a baby carriage, to personalize the violence about to take place. And this episode is enhanced by the repetition of individual scenes in re rhythmic sequence of various speeds, some projected at normal speed and some slowed down for dramatic effect. And I think perhaps the most memorable is, of course, the shooting of the young mother whose fall to the ground propels her baby carriage with a baby inside down several flights of stairs, picking up speed to meet an uncertain future. The tension of the sequence is broken by the firing of the Potemkin's guns on the Tsar's military headquarters. Eisenstein would go on to make other important films, including the sound film Alexander Nevsky, but he believed that sound and later color diminished montage effects. And of course Eisenstein disagreed with other Soviet filmmakers who coordinated sound with visuals. Yeah. His theories viewed sound as most effective when working against or out of sequence with the visuals. From Stalin's cinema during World War II, we turn back to Europe for Italian neorealism and the French New Wave. Yeah, if there's ever been an era when United States cinema was surpassed in aesthetic, philosophic, and audience appeal, it was the period of European cinema right after World War II. Prompted by years of war and devastation, European cinema explored many of the philosophical questions that had been raised in other mediums during the 20th century. Focused around a theme or psychological or philosophical issue rather than a story, these films brought cinema as an art form back in line with the dominant 20th century philosophical and literary pathways. And moreover, their look departed from a mainstream Hollywood studio style since their subject matter required a different manipulation of cinematic elements. The support of Italian cinema by Mussolini's government in Italy and then the disintegration of fascism in the country resulted in a generation of highly skilled filmmakers who now had the freedom to make the sorts of films that they wished. And post more shortages of film stock and materials and funds to construct sets resulted in films shot in real life settings and cast with non-professionals even. Yeah, these elements combined with true-to-life dialogue and an emphasis on the common people in their real-life context results in a new realism, also known as neorealism. Roberto Rossellini's Open City in 1945 is considered the first film in which the elements of the mo movement began coming together. Yeah, the most popular Italian neorealist director in the United States was Vittorio De Sica. And he produced and directed a film called The Bicycle Thief in 1948, which translated literally from the Italian is actually Bicycle Thieves. And this film likely represents the high point of Italian neorealism. 
Yeah, Tzitzika's production, based upon a script by Cesar Zavassini, tells the story of Antonio, whose wife pawns her wedding linen so her husband may reclaim his bicycle from a pawn shop. In an era of rampant post-war unemployment, a man with a bicycle is a man who can hold a job and feed his family. The theft of his bicycle sends Antonio and his son through the streets in all kinds of weather in search of the thief. But their journey also comes to represent the desperation of the man as he sees the security of his family slip away with each step. Antonio finds the bike, but with no proof, he is forced to relinquish it by the thief and the thief's mother and the neighborhood. Now Antonio becomes a bicycle thief himself, and he suffers the abuse of the community when he is caught. Antonio begins his journey home, but not without the love and support of his son, who slips his hand into his father's as the two become lost in the crowd. Filmed in a gritty style in the actual streets of Rome, the film's performers were non-professionals, and their characters are put in the context of the actual people suffering under economic, political, and social oppression and the somber, degraded world they're forced to live in. Certainly all of the elements of neorealism are brought together in the film to make a strong political statement in dramatic contrast to Hollywood studio-made productions of the same era. Interestingly, though, once neorealist elements seem to become codified, the movement or impulse wanes or changes by 1950. Yeah, indeed. The romantic and anti-romantic films of Federico Fellini and Michelangelo Antonioni, respectively, represent the thrust of Italian cinema into the 1960s. Fellini emphasized fantastic and whimsical settings with characters who seek joy, love, and happiness in films such as La Strada, which translates as The Road, 1954, Night of Cabria, 1956, and his most popular international success, La Dolce Vida, The Sweet Life, 1960. Yeah, these reflect the filmmaker's interest in sensuality and excess and his criticisms of the Catholic Church. And moreover, Fellini's Eight and a Half remains in the minds of many film historians and critics as his masterpiece in a self-reflective story of a filmmaker confronting the challenges of making the kind of film that Eight and a Half becomes. In contrast to Fellini's fast-paced, flamboyant fantasies, the films of Antonioni, such as 1962's La Ventura, seem slow and spartan with characters who suffer from an inability to feel. Natural settings, however, are portrayed in almost expressionist form, and the sea, the sky, and rocks along the shore are favorite subjects, along with the sleek, urban environments of the modern world. In an Antonioni film, characters learn to live in the ambiguity of the modern world, and while viewers often conclude none of the film's central issues are resolved, in fact, reconciliation is often more reflective of the ambiguity reflected in the human experience. Now, although the Second World War changed the world as individuals in the era knew it, the First World War was perhaps every bit as great a catalyst for changing art forms. Reflected in experimental French films by René Clair, Entre Act, 1924, and the surrealist collaboration of Salvador Dali and Luis Buñuel, Uncien Andalou, An Andalusian Dog, 1929, with its famous scene of a razor passing over the eye of a woman as wispy clouds pass over the moon. It was really the eye of a cow. In addition, the Danish director Abel Gantz made films throughout Europe, and he brought visual tricks such as early split-screen technology through superimposition, the use of multiple screens to form a triptych, did this in the six-hour epic Napoleon, Moreover, his 1918 Je Accuse used actual French soldiers on leave from the Western Front in presenting its powerful anti-war message. In addition, Carl Theodore Dreyer's The Passion of Joan of Arc, 1927, many consider the high point of French cinema in the 1920s. Yeah, because of its strong, luminous performance by René Falconetti and Dreyer's emphasis on the rich facial textures of characters against a blank backdrop, Many consider the film to illustrate the ultimate power of pure visual image. So then what Dreyer mastered visually in the 1920s, Jean Renoir offered by way of social satire in the 1930s. Most remarkable in the anti-war film The Grande Illusion, in which the filmmaker strips representative soldiers of their adversarial nationalities to expose the manufactured animosity between combatant nations, as well as the rules of the game where passions erupt during one weekend at a country house 
to reveal a dying social world. Sure. And certainly central to the later film is a rabbit hunt conducted according to a well-orchestrated set of rules that brings to the surface the stifling gentility behind upper-class social norms. To continue, the years immediately following World War II represented a return to a pre-war classicism and its concern with form in films by Max Offals, Jean Cocteau, and Robert Bresson. Yeah, the social critiques and emphasis on formalism then gave way to the French post-war experiments with the camera's potential to capture new realities leading up to the French New Wave, a 1959 break with French classicism. Speaking of which, the French New Wave, as it was called, is a term used to describe the cinema created in response to what younger filmmakers considered the plotting films of the French film establishment. Yeah. These filmmakers were made up basically of two groups, a collection of young film critics, later directors, under the leadership of film theorist and critic André Bazin in the journal Cadre du Cinéma, and the more experienced left bank group with their interest in the documentary form. The Cahiers group, including Francois Truffaut and Jean-Luc Godard, subscribed to the auteur theory, which placed directors as the central authors of films whose directorial traits were identifiable across the body of work. Yeah, the non-studio look of new wave films and on-site shooting locations created a sense of realism borrowed from Italian neorealism, but the goal of this new era of French cinema artists was to create a cinema in which each film and its subject matter dictated its own style. How true. One representative example includes Francois Truffaut's The 400 Blows, 1959, the story of a 13-year-old boy's encounters with the hypocrisy of the adults who imprison him in two institutions, one a school and one literally a prison. But audiences can't always tell which is which. Yeah. Throughout the film, the boy searches for opportunities to rebel, and the film's style represents Truffaut's efforts to liberate filmmaking as well. And we shouldn't overlook a second example, which is Godard's Breathless, 1959, which combines an episodic narrative in telling the story of a petty criminal, an anti-hero, with erratic filmmaking techniques, such as jump cuts that violate conventions of continuity editing. It should be noted briefly that the impulse to break out of conventions of filmmaking circled the world. The British film industry experienced a new wave of its own, sometimes labeled the kitchen sink tradition, to reflect the social realism of films like Look Back in Anger, 1959, The Loneliness of the Long Distance Runner, 1962, and Georgie Girl, 1966. These films emphasize the lives of working class men and women, and they are again shot in a gritty style in black and white. Before we conclude our look at national cinema, we turn to Scandinavia and Asia, specifically Japan, and the work of acclaimed directors Ingrid Bergman and Akira Kurosawa. A whole segment could be devoted to both filmmakers since they both enjoyed long and varied careers. Our cursory treatment of each master filmmaker basically can never do justice to the contributions of either. So we would urge viewers to pursue further the lives and works of these legends. Yeah, I mean, certainly from the, from the 1940s until the 2000s, Bergman created a body of work that addresses the often painful nature of interpersonal relations while a seemingly indifferent or non-existent deity stands by. In The Seventh Seal, 1956, for example, a knight returning from the Crusades plays a metaphorical chess game with death to an inevitable outcome. In the process, though, the knight discovers the meaning and value of life, well represented by a young, happy family that reenacts the family of Jesus. Yeah. Certainly Bergman's mastery of techniques is at its height in persona, a film that's actually a little difficult to describe. Um, the story involves an actress, played by Liv Ullman, who loses her voice in the middle of a performance of Electra and cannot or will not speak afterwards. And of course, in the process of psychiatric treatment, the lone voice of her uh, enthusiastic nurse fills the spaces in the interactions between the two, and Bergman depicts the narrative out of some sequence and in self-reflexive form. Yeah. The filmmaker's viewers are aware that a film is being made and shown, and at times even destroyed with scenes of film stock going through a projector and the frame becomes like the mental movie screen of the characters. Kurosawa's career parallels Bergman's in terms of length and diversity, but the filmic tradition out of which he produced his films was embedded in Japanese culture. Yeah, Kurosawa found success 
in both basic genres of Japanese cinema, the period or costume film set largely in the Japanese feudal area, and the film of contemporary Japanese life. As certainly the most well-known Japanese filmmaker in the West and the most influenced by the West, Kurosawa excelled in the samurai film, closely linked to the American Western. The Seventh Samurai, a dramatic story of underdogs in cooperation with one another against marauding bandits, lent itself to Western remakes such as The Magnificent Seven, 1960, and Sergio Leone's Spaghetti Western, Fistful of Dollars, 1964. And certainly in Kurosawa's Rashomon, he presents a multi-layered perspective of three witnesses at the inquest into the death of a man framed by a fourth perspective on the events. This reflects a major theme in Kurosawa cinema, the search for truth in an environment of relativity and subjectivity. And finally, uh, Kurosawa's Ran is a reworking of Shakespeare's King Lear with three sons instead of three daughters. We've only scratched the surface when it comes to the influence of cinema on the world and vice versa, but we hope we've whetted your appetite to know more and explore more on your own. With the internet, streaming, and DVD rentals, you can watch all of the films discussed today quite easily. Be sure and join us again when we investigate and examine motion pictures and their history on how Hollywood does it. Until next time, I'm Jeffrey Hill. And I'm Mark Graves. Thanks for watching.